Um, we're now going to enter into uh, a, a bit of conversation and hopefully some disagreement from the other people I have around this table and then from, uh, from all of you. Uh, and maybe we can start with you, Judy, Judy Weissman from uh, LSE. Um, a lot of what we've been hearing about is how a city becomes self-aware, reflective of its own physical movements and emotions and all sorts of other things, and even a suggestion that this will transform social science. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Is that, is that realistic? <laughs> um, well, certainly not. I mean, I know my role as a sociologist is to, is to kind of um, throw in some provocation. So if I can just do that for a moment. I mean, I think um, some of the things Wolfgang said was right, just to sort of go to that. And I think um, there are interesting issues about big data. But I must say that I couldn't help thinking as he was speaking about the very same logarithms being... Um, you know, causally implicated in the financial crisis and that, you know, a lot of the sort of big data sets that we've been hearing about as being sort of very efficient actually haven't been very efficient in terms of their kind of, you know, in terms of the financial sector and the economic sector. And I must say, as I hang out with sort of sociologists of technology, when I get sort of paranoid about surveillance, they're always the first to tell me this stuff doesn't work, Judy, don't worry about it. They're completely exaggerated claims that are being made. So. I think, yes, in some ways, um, the big data can do things, but I think it's incredibly limited as well. But can I just take a minute to say one other thing I'd sort of like to throw into the conversation? I'm sort of very struck by um, how we've talk been talking about the electric city, but we really haven't said very much about the electric home and what, and, and what, elec what the electric revolution did to the home. And I think when you look at the images of, of houses that we've been seeing here, there isn't really a, a discussion about the fact that in terms of domestic appliances, we still have very conventional single-family households and that it's a very sort of inefficient way to kind of lock in technology. And it seems to me that we're not really thinking um, very radically, actually, about different ways of living in terms of domestic life, that they're actually rather socially conservative, everything we've kind of seen here. And it's a very much a kind of engineering sense of what a house is rather than a home. So I sort of feel like we need to really connect back in. I mean, what's the, I mean, I, I was interested in smart houses literally 30 years ago, and I now don't talk about smart houses, you know, because they're always kind of about energy and entertainment and not actually about, you know, how people really live, what daily lives are like, and really talking to people within houses and thinking about what technologies we might design that, that could be better. I mean, you know, the image in a book of mine from 30 years ago is the, you know, the feminist sort of fantasy about a self-cleaning house. That, to me, would be a really kind of smart house. So I just wanted to sort of throw that into the conversation. Well, can, can I maybe bring in uh, Aisha and Mark to comment on that? Because the, the sort of the future home has been a staple of expos back to the late mm. 19th century, Paris and Chicago. But as you say, the vision of the smart home has hardly materialized at all in the last generation. And there must be some interesting lessons in why, why did that not happen, Aisha? Well, I think that um, before I, I answer that, I think what was really missing, and, and partly what you're talking about goes to that, is that we've been taking citizens um, of cities to be these passive individuals to which technology happens. And I think that we should remember that we're living in the information age, and a number of us have already been giving away a lot of information and participating in the information age by downloading applications like Facebook and agreeing to licenses in which we have given, um, giving away a lot of personal data. And I think what we really need is to include them in the conversation by having intermediaries or translators that are able to describe what this invisible, and Carlo actually pointed that out, you said it's a beautiful thing when you forget the technologies in the public space. It's beautiful and dangerous at the same time because once it becomes invisible, you, you know, when, when somebody puts up a bridge, I know what's happening, but when somebody changes the software and it now has facial recognition in it, I don't know that. So coming back to Facebook, um, Facebook acquired face.com, which is an Israeli company, last year. Nobody really talks about it. What, is ha what has Facebook been doing for one year with this company? It's been training its algorithms on our pictures. So I just think that it's time to not just think if we just gave citizens, you know, if we protected them from technology or if we gave it to them, they would do such a good job. I think we should take the responsibility that, in fact, we too easily give the rights away to technology sometimes. And then coming back to the smart home, I think that 
the smart home has been another one of these things that, that like Mastar, like Songdo, like Living Planet, are things that are still not realistic. Um, if you go to Living Planet, and I've been there, it's a green field city. It's literally green field. There's a green field there. It's not going to be a reality. I've been to Songdo. Uh, the simulations don't really depend on them. We're really not there yet. But they are possible with cheap sensors to outfit homes where it is possible to take care of our elderly. And I think those are the kinds of things that we begin to think about and we can get some, um, some inspiration from frugal innovation in the developing world, like India, like even in China, where they have been able to make cheap adjustments to homes. It's still not the futuristic home where we have a robotic nanny who comes and cleans up the home, but we can improve the quality of life through uh, cheaper technologies and mesh networks. Very important point there about presentations. Perhaps we could have a rule in the future you can only show photographs of real places, not the simulations. There's been a whole series of future cities presented entirely through the plans. And I have to say, when I first went to New Songdo and found it was just mud, I was a bit disappointed. And all of you actually presented simulation photographs, not real ones, uh, which does slightly confuse this debate. Uh, Mark. Yes, I, I, I was interested that um, I, I come from the world of lighting, which curiously throughout all of the conversations uh, about smart city yesterday uh, didn't really get a mention, which is, and it's one of those, uh, perhaps it's a sort of considered to be a dumb technology, but it, um, in a way it is actually a very smart technology that we've adapted and used over uh, many centuries in different ways. Uh, starting as an autonomous technology is now something that's delivered to us through the electric city, which... Um, has a has an enormous power uh, starting in our home and working out into the city to um, sort of bring us together uh, both socially and also uh, inform uh, our sort of our economic lives so wh one of the things i've been interested in listening to um, and in a way we sort of started with jason hawkes's lovely film where actually what i like about that sort of image of a city of night is you know the fact that people are working in their buildings you can see that people are working in the buildings you see whether somebody's home or not uh, you see the transactions taking place in the street uh, revealed uh, revealed through light. Um, what I um, uh, what what I really wanted to sort of pick up on was this idea that Richard uh, introduced and uh, Adam was talking so well about sort of using new tools well and how you can actually use technologies to bring people together because I think light actually or lighting uh, does that in, uh, in in the city. I mean on a on a on a social level. I mean Don Slater at the LSE has just started a project looking at how sort of the, the social impacts of light at the Supermoon. I think it's a sort of fascinating <coughs> project to uh, begin with, and I think that's, a, that's going to be a major, that there's very little research into this, and I think it's going to be a major area to um, promote. But also what I'm, uh, we're, we're particularly interested in is also the sort of economic power of this tec technological layer of lighting, um, which informs other smart uh, layers. Um, uh, and, and what it actually does for our cities. I mean, I was reading a, a report that uh, said that um, uh, the UK economy, the nighttime economy, is actually worth uh, 66 billion uh, to the UK, uh, of which actually Westminster itself has a two billion pound nighttime economy. So what we begin to understand is that if light is a sort of social thing, uh, or, or is a sort of tool for uh, social cohesion, you know, we've told stories around a campfire we now do a sort of larger version of that. In fact, buildings now tell us stories through light, uh, media screens, etc. But if we look at that aspect, and then we look at how actually powerful that seemingly dumb, but I think actually quite smart layer of lighting uh, in our cities uh, can be to actually help us economically, what we see is that the tools that we certainly work with as lighting designers are perhaps one of those tools can you know, be used, uh, sort of, y you said using new tools well, uh, uh, Richard, I think it's like using old, an old tool, uh, lighting, to sort of bring us, uh, bring us together, which then feeds into the home. And I think the home, um, you know, uh, we haven't addressed the smart home um, uh, because I think actually people are quite used to working with technologies like lighting, switching a light on, switching it off, doing it down and dimming it up. And actually they are using technologies in a smart way if you give them to them in a way that they can understand and and just one little question. What's the role of darkness in the future ah. smart city and smart home? Well, uh, we're, we're very interested as lighting designers in uh, darkness. I came back from a, um, 
a uh, very interesting uh, conference, very small conference in uh, Chile um, uh, a few weeks ago, which was the first international conference on darkness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. uh, it was the first it's a hot topic, darkness. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, you might think a lighting designer was very unwelcome at, uh, at this conference, but not at all. I mean, you know, uh, many of us are doing a lot of work in addressing issues such as light pollution, the adverse impacts of the fact that cities never sleep, then stop us sleeping. Um, uh, that, that, um, that darkness, I think, in the, in the future city needs to play a role. I mean, just like landscape played a role uh, in the uh, 18th and 19th century development of cities as quiet and contemplative spaces, um, you know, I think dark areas of cities will be necessary to preserve to, to help us all live well. M M Michael Kimmelman, can you tell us what, what of what you've heard in the last hour or so do you think would actually enhance the creative capacity of a city, the ability of people to make something creative in their lives or work? Yeah, I, um, I've been struck by a bunch of things um, that people have said, including I, I like the story that the, of the breakdown of your project in Saragossa, because of course it is precisely when the technology- Can you speak slightly closer to Yeah, the sorry, sorry. I thought it was interesting that when the technology of your project broke down, you, you, you found people making an interesting use of this. Space and um, yeah, I, I I've been very uh, I, I naturally I, I am inclined to agree with uh, much of what Adam and Richard are saying, which is to say that um, cities cannot be just technologically uh, designed and and from above, and that they but I, but I have a certain faith in the resilience of cities. You know, Oscar Niemeyer died yesterday, and. Um, and Brasilia is a very interesting case. I mean, he didn't design it, but it struck me that um, he, he once said, you know, that y you might not want to live in Brasilia, but it's, it's a real city. And I think it's a good example of the adaptability uh, of, um, of humans of that we have to uh, what are often top-down uh, things. So I think technology is, is a good case of this, that we are we make use of technology to a large extent um, uh, in ways that cannot be anticipated. Um, and then the question really becomes, as Adam raised, I think quite properly, access to this information. What does it really mean to have open data? How, how is this really going to um, happen in such a way? I, I, I take your, um, for instance, your uh, patio of the restaurant at, at in front of Scala, but I was noting as I saw that, you probably have to buy a coffee to, to sit there. So this question of the relation of commerce and access to information, I think, is important. But here's, here's what I was going to say, that I, I think the resilience um, uh, is, is the creative um, answer to your question. That is to say, um, uh, Adam mentioned uh, sand, uh, Occupy Sandy. So to me, this remains a very interesting paradigmatic example. You, you have an argument often made about Tahrir and many other places that it is, it is propelled by a shared technology, Facebook, Twitter. This is not really so much true. There's, it, it's certainly propelled by mobile phones and uh, SMSing. But to a large extent, it's propelled by people coming together in an actual real space, the kind of spaces Richard's talking about that the need for these spaces and the power of actual space um, and, and for the kind of interactions that can only happen face to face cannot be simulated, that, that this, um, this has been trumping all of the predictions in a way about, about the uses of technology, about the ways in which people network, that I, that I think in very profound ways, we are constantly overestimating the power of technology to shape our actions in our cities. I, I believe that there are genuine threats to security and great potential in the shared information we're all talking about. But I also believe that as this evolves, there we will find ways to access this information and make use of it. Uh, I just, uh, I mean, just one last thing along these lines, and I'll, I'll shut up about it. But um, I was, I was struck after uh, Hurricane Sandy by the issues of um, redesign, how we need to think about redesigning New York and what this means both technologically um, and physically in terms of moving neighborhoods and so forth. So I was reminded of the case of L'Aquila. And I was struck in the case of L'Aquila where many of you may recall there was a big uh, earthquake in 2009 and since which the, um, the center of the city, the historic 
core urban center the identity of this great regional city has not been repaired i was struck that the italian prosecutors have have convicted the meteorologists for failing to predict the essentially for a technological failure but have not yet prosecuted all of the government officials and others who i'm not suggesting they need to be prosecuted but let's keep our eye on the ball those people who really are killing the city who really killed the city which is to say they have failed to recognize that the city is a network of streets and spaces and the absence of the rejuvenation of that historical center that luckily is essentially a dead city again it's the overestimation in a certain sense of the technological aspect um and of the of the importance of of actual real spaces that i think is something we're not focused on can i take us back to where where richard really began uh, this morning um <clears throat> which is the question of what kind of city is cognitively enhancing or a mind enhancing environment we have many smart technologies which are about essentially material flows of energy or transport and so on which probably aren't inherently that mind enhancing but you're i think asking a question what kind of city actually smartens people up mm -hmm. rather than dumbs them down mm -hmm. now this relates to the question of the programmability of the city all the technologies we've talked about are very good at reducing disruption to use adam's uh, point there's a very interesting finding in educational technology that for children to learn well is actually quite important their rewards are slightly unpredictable and slightly random they learn much better with random rewards than very predictable ones and it may be the same is true of a city as a whole who around this table wants to offer an insight into uh, an uh, ideal an evidenced insight into what kind of urban environments actually do smarten up rather than stupefy uh, i've got an example of that and again it, it goes back to occupy sandy um where the city Could you speak closer to yes absolutely i'm sorry it, it goes back to occupy sandy which uh, is is the arm if you will of occupy wall street that has turned itself to to hurricane relief assistance in new york city um, very consciously predicated on values of mutual aid and solidarity, uh, a horizontal leaderless structure. Um, what we find is that the spontaneous or near spontaneous self-organization of people into an extraordinarily not efficient but effective relief operation brings out resources that people, I believe, didn't know that they had. And as a matter of fact, people that in other contexts would be considered marginal in contemporary culture discovering capacities in themselves, capabilities in themselves, predilections in themselves that they had been taught by society, by acculturation, were not wanted, were not valued. Mm -hmm. What I've seen in the past several weeks is that through the process of forming this extended articulated network of mutual aid, people are discovering these amazing capacities in themselves and reconceptualizing the way in which they confront the world reconceiving of themselves as actors. And it's, uh, I have to say, it's the most inspiring thing I've been involved in in, in the last two decades. It's, it's incredible to watch. I, I'd um, respond to your question, if we all think back to yesterday, to the sudden star turn of a mayor and, and a, a prime minister announcing 50 million uh, pounds to build a center for innovation. The reason that the area w that we're in is uh, a center for innovation already is that most of the firms that are here were not meant to be here. Um, they had a very adverse relationship to their locality. Um, they dealt with it. The, the agglomeration effects that, th that they experienced were of people not um, exactly working together or competing against each other, but in some very amorphous zone of exchange. Probably the most important um, institution around here for creative types is a Pret-a-Manger, which is around the corner, which is huge, and which has evidently very good Wi-Fi reception. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time there. But the point I'm making is that when the Prime Minister and the Mayor announced that now there'll be a dedicated space to creativity, my thought was the, this area is now over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. So, so, so
So um, imagine if, if they were listening and they said, you're obviously right, Richard. How should we spend that 50 million pounds? <laughs> Spread it around. Well, actually, yesterday, and, and, one, yeah. of the, one of the speakers was very much talking about the importance of skills. What I wanted to say to Willets is don't, you know, you know, don't build a building, you know, don't wreck higher education. I mean, that was a big theme yesterday in some of the, the speakers, actually, that the higher the skill level in, in the population, you know, the more innovative companies that you have. Uh, and Michael, one, one sentence on how you would smarten up a city, as it were. How I would smarten up a city. Um, well, I mean, I think I, I would try to do it simply by uh, democratizing resources. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, that can be information and technology. Uh, and it, I, I like the idea of, of giving towards education rather than, uh, than uh, towards the center. I mean, um, Richard raised an interesting point in the, in, uh, in the paper, uh, which was about uh, the changing role of certain kinds of institutions. And here I I think, again, this adaptability is interesting. Libraries, I was thinking. Right. So libraries used to be, of course, a place where people needed to go for information. And now the line that most people have is, you know, books, well, everything will be online. People don't need libraries. Actually, libraries have become incredibly critical elements, especially in working class and poorer communities. I speak from New York as a good example. Uh, as community centers, places for the elderly, cultural centers, places for teens to go after school, the physical space is very important. And the people who design libraries now and think about this need to think of a new function for this. It's no longer the Carnegie Library, now it's the kind of community center. So um, it's not quite an answer to your question, but, but, but what has happened? You have a technology that has changed the nature of the physical space and people have adapted to it in such a way that the institutions themselves change. I'd like to open up for um, comments, violence, disagreement from the audience. Just on the library point, we, we actually work with a library in South London, which has got the public to put their own book collections on the library database. One of lots and lots of collaborative consumption tools, which do give you the intelligence not only of the books, but also getting to know people in your street uh, and so on. Mm. We've got someone over here uh, and here. If you would stand up, introduce yourself, and be as pithy as possible. Hello, I'm Hilaire Schocken. Uh, I think you asked what should be done to make a city more in, uh, uh, intelligent, intelligible. I think the, the best thing to do is to take care that there will be people in the street and that you will know nothing about them. So there will be a possibility to make contact with somebody you don't know. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, cities are made for that. Uh, cities are the predecessors of Facebook. And the success of cities only predicts the success of Facebook because the Facebook follows the cities. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing about the 50 million, uh, why not invest in wi free Wi-Fi in the streets uh, for people rather than making the uh, temple for technology? Uh, I think in London we know Patterson Station that was built as a temple for electricity. And now we are seeing a, a temple for uh, IT technology. So I, I think we have to learn from the past and not build uh, temples for technology, but temples for people. Okay, I'd like some comment also on the face recognition, facial recognition technology, and is that the vision of heaven or hell? O over here, please. Um, and do we want, s is sonar our vision of the future of the city or not? Hello, my name is Elaine Beebe from Arup. Um, I enjoyed your uh, critiques of the, of the smart city, and particularly that your point around the smart city stupefying effect of technology. But I think you also showed in your examples that urban design can equally be a stupefying uh, uh, factor in, in the examples that you showed. Um, and I think that brings me to the larger point, which I think the critiques that Adam and, and Richard are, are part of, which is about how we make cities and how we, the role of leadership and the role, uh, role of informed leadership uh, and citizens in actually making cities. And I think this conference is a fantastic step forward in bringing urbanists into, into the debate. But we also need our urban designers and our leaders to be more informed about the potential of technology as we become them. C can I just ask you, cities are places of argument. What did you most disagree with, as you say? Uh, <laughs> um, 
I, I thought that the, um, <coughs> the examples of Mazdar and Songo are potentially perhaps not really where the debate is now. I think the debate now has moved on a lot in the last couple of years in terms of cities actually being a lot more informed. And at the, I went to a recent conference in Barcelona around smart cities, and the talk there was all about citizen participation. So last year it was a lot about the industry vision, and Adam gave a very good talk last year about uh, critiquing the role of industry. But I think now cities are being a lot more uh, proactive and a lot more talking about citizen participation and the role of, of technology in enforcing economic development. Which by definition means not the greenfield sites where there aren't any no, citizens no. to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep saying a lot from Bogota. Uh, I would say that uh, unfortunately the biggest problem in the world cities is not that they are too planned, but that they are too unplanned. Maybe Mazda is too planned, but uh, in the developing world, we still have chaos, too much spontaneity in the, in the, in the slums, in the, in the places that grow in the wrong places, uh, where there is huge consumption of energy because they go. Uh, so, of course, I agree fully that some cities maybe is self-defined, but on the other hand, uh, you really need some intervention from some experts at some point that the city should grow in the right places, some planning. The, the question is how much planning? What should the planners do and what should be left for the spontaneity? Yeah. I, I'm going to ask all of our speakers about two sentences mm. each to sum up, but let's, let's try and get a couple more comments here. Uh, quick one. I'm Matthias. I'm from Hamburg. I'm a transformation designer. And I understand the electric city is also a very vulnerable one. Uh, just you named Sandy, uh, electricity, you know, the power law. And now that I've seen these examples in Rio de Janeiro where you have these huge control rooms, which are generally kind of a good idea towards more of a liquid city planning, for example, power laws can also mean something very different in the future, right? If you imagine they have no power anymore in this control room, what will happen? Anarchy or mayhem, chaos, I don't know. So my question would be, where are the firewalls for these kind of future, you know, sensible smart cities that should also be part of the system? Thank you. And how do you get resilience from buffers, whether it's your finance system or your power supply? Saskia. Uh, Saskia Sassen. I want to come back to the question of making the city or making cityness. So it is especially Adam and Richard. And Adam, I want to just read your what you ended with, which was that the smartness should be in the people making the city or making the neighborhood, making etc. And that we should not think of the technology as controlling the smartness. Now, Occupy movement, you emphasized, and you s you used a particular phrase, yeah, because this was part of your final illustration, and you said they discover in themselves things they didn't know they had. No, I disagree. I think occupying was hard work, and they developed social capability. Now then I want to take it, what does that mean? Very, very briefly. Vis-a-vis -vis the technology, making cities, but we also need to develop capabilities, in a way, technical capabilities in the citizens. So it's, you know, so I just wanted the two of you to address that briefly. Okay. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to say literally a couple of sentences. We have to respect coffee, which, as Richard has reminded us, is all important to city yeah, life. Absolutely. And coffee awaits us in about three minutes' time. So, Carlos, we start with you. Sure. Um, but I, I'll, uh, instead of, it's impossible to answer, there's, there's different points, but I think there's one thing we all agree about. Uh, and uh, that's all of this is not about technology. All of this is really about people. But the potential for this in what we see in Occupy Wall Street, in Occupy New York, in uh, what we see in the Arab Spring, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. It's almost something I would call uh, like an urban spring. Uh, you know, the fact that it all of this allows us really to change many dynamics of the city or participation, what goes back to Jane Jacobs is the same thing, but we can do it in a different way today. And I think, you know, if we look at that, then we can forget, I think something, yes, I agree with one of the last comments, a comment by Elaine, I believe, that um, uh, some of the discussion was looking at things that were about smart cities a couple of years ago, the smart city debate a couple of years ago, Songdo, Mazda, and so on, um, because really um, all of this is, uh, if we look at the other perspective about how this can allow people to, uh <coughs> in the bottom up, to respond to this technology, then there's an exciting space of new possibilities there. 
Yes, I, I mean, I think it's uh, following on from what Carlo's saying about it, you know, in a way, focusing on people. I think, um, you know, what I was trying to say earlier was understand that there are, are technologies that have been around for a long time, if you see what I mean, that are getting smarter. We'll not forget those, that it's not just about new technologies, but it's also about technologies that we've used for many centuries that are gradually getting smarter, that people are familiar with, that started perhaps autonomously and are now sort of organized systems, and perhaps looking to some of those systems um, in order to sort of uh, inform the debate further and not just focusing on perhaps some of the sort of the super smart technologies uh, that have been talked about in, uh, in the last 24 hours. I'd like just to agree with the gentleman from Bogota and say that the debate between bottom-up and top-down, I think, is a false debate. Um, while it's necessary to empower people, let's not forget that some planning is necessary in Asia and Latin America. I always find it interesting when people talk about a smartphone application in New York that's crowdsourced and tells you when the trains are not running on time. That's great, but it'll tell me the same thing every day because the trains are never fixed in New York. <laughs> so you definitely need the physical and the soft infrastructure together, and that requires large investment and governance and policy planning. Uh, yeah, I have to echo exactly what uh, Aisha was saying, because um, apropos of, um, of Hurricane Sandy, it's a very good example, I think, of and, and also what Enrique was trying to emphasize, that this is not a binary thing in which it's uh, bottom up, top down. You, you need to have uh, large uh, organizational top-down planning things with technology and infrastructure and everything else and and sometimes that involves political decisions which are not entirely democratic that is to say uh, everyone cannot participate but I the, the part of this that uh, I've just been struck by here and trying to emphasize is that I think there is this way in which uh, people adapt technologies adapt urban situations adapt Brasilia adapt uh, whatever technological things they have. In other words, we, for all of our top-down planning, there, there is a, uh, an, an inevitable kind of, uh, and healthy, uh, don't mean to sound pie in the sky, but I think a healthy way in which we, we tend to claim and reuse and remake what, what we're given from the top. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, in my presentations and writing, I, I obviously give a very hard time to the sort of command and control institutions, but I think there is a role, a very clear role, and, and, and I, I echo both of your comments. Um, I, I think it, it occurs to me that in a very neat way, for me personally, um, design for network cities almost joins Saskia's life work and Richard's life work. I, I think that it's the, the goal of these technologies in network is the production of a metropolitan self. And I, I, that's what I see myself as working towards and I'm very delighted to hear that, that these are the, the, the themes that are emerging from this work. Um, I just wanted to kind of add a cautionary note, I guess, because I'm very attracted by the notion of kind of the meeting strangers, but I think people have this sense that particularly looking to young people, everyone says, let's look at how young people are using social media, this is the future, let's look at it. Well, you know, I have recently looked at all the data on how um, young Americans um, are using the social media, and basically they're interacting very intensely with a group of friends they already know, they already know them, that's who they, you know, that that actually it isn't this great extending of networks, this great um, meeting of strangers, and they're doing it a lot in places like libraries. So, you know, I mean, you know, the world isn't virtual. They're not living a lot of their world really virtually. They're living it via the media with their mates, and they need spaces in cities where they can, um, you know, relax and be with their mates, whether it's, you know, and what one sees now very much in pubs in London and everywhere is that young people are, are kind of with each other and there's lots of other people there as well via the sort of technologies and they need a physical space in which to, to do that. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to take the opportunity and respond to your <laughs> criticism, <laughs> um, which I couldn't um, so far. Uh, so um, I guess the ec economic crisis or the, the algorithms that, that were relevant in for, for the economic crisis were uh, in part different because it was not so much about correlated data sets. Uh, it was not so much about correlating these uh, parameters of human life as uh, more about like uh, earning money or trying to organize uh, economics in a way that you're able to um, gain things. So I guess we have to be, um, so m my final statement I guess would be that we just have to be wary of these kinds of controls that are developing or that might be and um, might be uh, made possible by these data sets and we 
uh, it's more a contextual question. It's not so much a yes or no que question. It's a contextual question in, in which instant, in which situations is this possible? And then we just have to, I mean, and that's a theme that's repeatedly come up, that we have to pr provide for, for freedom, the freedom to, to act, to choose, and um, kind of see the city maybe as, as a puzzle piece and allow us uh, to keep the opportunity to piece it together, together in different ways. Uh, well, I'd like to make uh, two final comments. One is that, uh, oddly enough, I think the issue of technology has made a different kind of configuration for interdisciplinary study of the city. We need to know about things like how people experience complexity or simplicity and, and so on, is it, um, which are developmental and psychological questions. And I think one of the things that will happen to urban studies, at least in universities, is the more technologically we get focused, the more we have to really think about psychological issues as a kind of, as a domain for evaluating what happens. The other thing that I'd like to say is I'd like to put in a plug for um, the research work that I and a group of colleagues are doing in um, the London School of Economics. Uh, called Teatro Mundi, which Michael has been called, in which there are some people scattered around the room, who, who uh, a, which is an attempt to look at what are the conditions, social conditions, of complexity in modern cities and how do they relate to urban culture. And you can go on to our website, here's my plug, <laughs> it's called Teatrum, T-H-E-A-T-R-U-M dot uh, Mundi, Dash. Oh, yeah, that's right, dash. Teatrum <laughs> dash <laughs> mundi, M U N D I dot org. Have I got it right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, this is a field of research for us yeah. about how uh, complexity and culture combine together in cities. And I'm sure Michael or somebody else can tell you the right way to get access <laughs> to this, to this wonderful website. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Just, just two final comments from me before coffee. One is perhaps an optimistic uh, note, which is, comes from the research of James Flynn. Some of you will be aware of his work on intelligence globally, which shows that overall IQ goes out up about, on average, 0.4 a year and seems to correlate with urbanization. Yeah. And it's particularly the elements of intelligence which are about abstract conceptual reasoning and coping with ambiguity, which yeah. seem to rise uh, fastest and it opens up a great research program of what are the most intelligence enhancing environments and which ones don't. As Judy said, all the technologies we have don't automatically though encourage mixing of strangers and that may need a little bit of social engineering and design uh, even in the modern city. So in the spirit of that, I would urge you over coffee <laughs> to speak to <laughs> at least one stranger about ambiguity and see what happens. <laughs> Thank you all very much.